Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Brand, director of the Getty Museum, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the presentation of the first in an annual series sponsored by the Getty's Villa Council. Founded in 2001, the Villa Council is comprised of dedicated supporters of the arts who believe strongly in the mission and goals of the Getty Villa. The unifying thread among the members is their enthusiasm for the ancient world, and over the past seven years, their funds have made possible a variety of projects, including the development of the family room at the villa, the production of theatrical performances, including the outdoor theater, the sponsorship of guest curators for some of our special exhibitions, and the support for programs related to special exhibitions. Most recently, the Hot Glass Roadshow from the Corning Museum um, that was in residence in the villa last fall with the Reflecting Antiquity exhibition. Their interest in the Getty and its programs and their generous support of, of our endeavours is truly greatly appreciated. If I could please just uh, encourage the members of the Council here with us this evening to stand up so we can give them a well-deserved round of applause. Our inaugural presentation tonight is Writing Historical Fiction, The Ancient World in Modern Literature. We are delighted to welcome three guests. Stephen Pressfield is a local author who has written five books based in the ancient Greek world. His first novel of ancient historical fiction, Gates of Fire, was described in the New York Review of Books as a, quote, kind of heroic saga drenched in the gore of battle and the dust of Spartan discipline. But apparently it had nothing to do with the film 300, which I saw <laughs> 10 minutes of on a flight somewhere before I gave up. As a testament to the level of historical accuracy that Mr. Pressfield achieves in his work, Gates of Fire has been included in the curriculum of the US Military Academy and the US Naval Academy, and is on the Commandant's reading list for the Marine Corps. His most recent historical novel is The Afghan Campaign, a novel that recreates Alexander the Great's invasion of the Afghan kingdoms in 330 BC. Our second guest focuses attention on the ancient Roman world. Stephen Saylor is the author of the popular Roma Sub Rosa mystery series featuring the Roman investigator Gordianus the Finder. His most recent publication is an epic novel that follows members of two of Rome's most prominent families over the course of the city's first thousand years. So, of course, we were pumping him for political uh, tips this evening and just gives the, the Roman spin on the election campaign. <laughs> the Sunday Times of London has noted just how convincingly Mr. Saylor evokes the ancient world. Engaging these two gentlemen in conversation on the topic of historical fiction is someone who needs almost no introduction uh, to this Los Angeles audience. Pat Morrison is an award-winning journalist, author, and commentator. She can be heard daily on her eponymous show on the national public radio station, KPCC, and writes a weekly editorial for the Los Angeles Times. Her book, Rio LA, Tales from the Los Angeles River, was honored in 2002 as the best nonfiction book by the Southern California Booksellers Association. She is well known for her political acumen and ready wit, and we're delighted to have her here with us tonight. But before I sort of um, hand over the stage, I would like to thank uh, two of my colleagues who have helped put the evening together, Peter Evans and Lisa Gazetta, who just do amazing logistical work here. Thank you, Peter and Lisa. Now also, um, after the, the uh, presentation here, um, I'd like to invite you all to a reception in the Cafe Terrace, just across the way here. We'll have a chance to, uh, to meet the speakers and uh, meet some of us from, from the Getty. Uh, but anyway, now I'd like to invite our guests up on the stage and I'd like to re sort of hand the stage over to Pat Morrison. So welcome, guests. Thanks, Michael. Mm. 
First, I think we should ask that your cell phones are off and we need to check our own because we can be more sinned against than sinning sometimes on that. So please do turn off your cell phones because we want the atmosphere to be ancient. <laughs> and unless you had a hieroglyph click keypad, I don't know that that would uh, suit our purposes. And I want to make sure you can hear all of us. So if you could say a few words, gentlemen. Uh, am I on? <laughs> okay. Well, that's for you to judge. And seven years ago. <laughs> So thank you all for coming this evening. I think we all know, and certainly in what I do, I run across so many people from different walks of life. Whoops. There are men and women out there who can describe to you in detail the battle insignia of the Roman army and the imperial order of march of any regiment. These are people who never went to college, much less to Rome. There are people out there who know chapter and verse of the Tudor property and marriage laws and who can tell you anything about midwifery in 12th century France. They didn't go to college to study these things. They have no particular expertise, but they read the books by people like my guests here on stage tonight. I think of historical fiction as continuing education because it takes us to places and into the minds of people we would never, ever know otherwise. The, um, the research that these men do, it's really a combination of two genres. It is the work of nonfiction, and it is the imagination of fiction brought together in this extraordinary genre of whom you have two extraordinary exemplars sitting here with me. The other advantage I think of historical fiction is apart from the continuing education aspect, it brings you a respect and a value and an understanding of the past. People who might not have a reverence for it otherwise would come to a place like the Getty Villa and have an intuitive understanding and an intellectual understanding that would not have existed before with some of the objects here. The objects become a way of channeling to this distant past and the characters that are brought to life in the pages of books like theirs make it very real to them. It is not abstract, it is not academic. The people in the ancient world become just as real as the people in their own lives. And so, as I said, you have two of the best practitioners here, and we have time for your questions later, but for my questions now to both of them. So, gentlemen, thank you for putting yourselves in my hands. <laughs> now, we were talking a bit earlier, and, and of course, we all talk, as writers, we talk about our influences. So I'd like to know what, maybe what was the first piece of historical fiction or the first piece of media of historical fiction that you picked up that may have engaged your imagination to pursue what it is that you do now? For me, I think, uh, you know, I haven't even thought about that, Pat, until you asked me, but um, it was Mutiny on the Bounty, which um, I don't know if you know the story of Nordoff and Hall and how they got into that. They were, they were two fighter pilots from World War I. And they, when the war was over, you know, they flew into Lafayette Espadrille or whatever it was, and uh, they, uh, they got back to civilian life and they started getting into a lot of trouble. And they had a friend who was, you know, getting drunk and stuff like that. And they had a friend who said, you guys need something to, to take your, you know, to engage your imagination. He said, why don't you write the story of the bounty? And they did. And uh, I just thought it was a fascinating book that I've read many, many times over. Did you see yourself as Marlon Brando? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> more as Charles Walton. Kind of a <laughs> that was the earlier version of the it. The earlier so. version. And, and how did you make the transition from I can read that to I can write that? That's, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, for me, I, it was sort of accidental that I got into doing this. I, the first book that I wrote was uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance. That got, the first book we got published, which is about golf. And uh, they, the publisher just wanted another one, and I didn't know what to do. So uh, I, uh, I just happened to be uh, a fan of ancient Greece just from reading it for fun. And uh, so I just thought, I'll try something there. And, and one thing led to another, but I wasn't planning that at all. And, and before I forget, I think you're an honorary citizen of Sparta, are you not? I am. And you don't, you don't have to fight in a loincloth with a shield no, or anything. Naked, as okay. we were talking on the email. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> so, and, and you were influenced by a film. The movies, yeah. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the 1960s, uh, the popular cinema was saturated with ancient world movies. Uh, Steve Reeves' is Hercules and all those sword and sandal epics. I hear applause. <laughs> I must be in Los Angeles. Probably <laughs> <laughs> just you know, mission Where star. Where Steve apply. Reeves be a known name? Uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, Spartacus, the movie Spartacus, the movie Ben-Hur, which won all those Oscars. 
all those Bible epics from the 50s, but this great, uh, the holy grail for me always is the movie Cleopatra with uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, and Rex Harrison. I guess growing up in a very small town in Texas, um, even, even there in that tiny cattle town, uh, the enormous scandal involving the making of that movie, the enormous publicity, was just a huge, a huge deal. And uh, I was longing to see it as, a, I guess, an eight-year-old boy. But all we had was a drive-in movie out in a, a cattle field. And it took a couple of years for that movie to come to Gulfway, Texas. And at last, it showed up. And I, I, can, I, feel, I remember my excitement. Finally, I'm going to see Cleopatra, the movie. And we drove in. And uh, I don't know if anybody here remembers drive-in movie theaters. But you drove in, and you put this, uh, you put this speaker in your window. And uh, very hot in Texas, I'm sure, in summer. And, the moon, the, the moon rises, the stars pop out, and uh, the cattle fall asleep over in the field. <laughs> and uh, the film began. And uh, we were in ancient Egypt, and I was just transported. But the drawback was the projectionist was the husband of the fifth grade school teacher. And with these racy new movies out of Hollywood, he felt he had to censor them. He had to pretend, like in Cinema Paradiso, you may remember. The projectionist would cover the, the uh, image <laughs> when there was a kissing scene. Well, there's a scene where Elizabeth Taylor is essentially nude in her bath in Alexandria, and the camera begins to pan in. She has just a tiny uh, cloth over her posterior cleavage, and there's tinkling music, and the camera's getting closer. And suddenly, he would hit a button, and something would, it would just rocket forward. <laughs> it was a blur, all a blur. And the next scene was Roddy McDowell as Octavian in the Roman Forum. And I made this loud groan in the back seat. Oh. And my older brother nudged me like, oh, you really wanted to see that. But for me, it was the historian who was disappointed. I, I wanted, <laughs> no, I he wanted to see. He for the articles, too. Uh, I wanted to see every minute of Cleopatra, having waited so long. So the, uh, I had lack of closure with Cleopatra. And <laughs> I think that led me on this quest to write about the ancient world. I, I will tell you this, just last year, uh, they showed a sparkling new print of Cleopatra. It went around the country. I was fortunate to see it at the Paramount Theater in Austin, a great old movie theater. And um, I saw scenes from Cleopatra I've never seen before. <laughs> so now I think, and boy, was that a long evening. Let me tell you, all four hours, four and a half hours of the original Cleopatra. But it was worth every minute of it. Uh, I you speak of Spartacus about a year or so ago. I met Kirk Douglas at the LA Times Book Festival when we did an event there. And ever since then, I've called him muscles, and he calls me legs. <laughs> so uh, he's, he's still got the muscles. And, uh, and he wears red socks, which would not pass, I think, the Spartacus test. But uh, uh, in, in terms of historical fiction, the first book I remember reading of that genre was a juvenile series that some of you may recall. And I found the original in like a secondhand store. It's called We Were There. Mm, we Were There. And it put young people, juveniles in you know, Caesar's legions in, in, in uh, uh. England. And, and it was a phenomenal series. And I think part of the appeal of it is that unlike a history book, there is a personality that you can latch onto, whether you are a man or a woman, you know, your age, your upbringing. And how do you craft the characters that carry the story? Because you've got actual historical figures, and then you've got people you have to dream up to contrive. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I go about it the way I think any fiction writer goes about it, which is, we might as well get technical here, right? That's what we're, that's what we're here about. I want to ask one question just before we begin. Show of hands, how many people here are either have written historical fiction, are writing historical <laughs> fiction, or aspire to writing? Ah, so, okay. Okay, I have another question. So we, how many of you are writing screenplays? Oh, yeah. That are historical? Aha! <laughs> So I, I'm a writer that attacks uh, any piece of material thematically, whether it would be contemporary or historical. And I'm always trying to figure out what is this story about. Like if, if, if a, a particular piece from the ancient world grabs me, let's say the story of Alcibiades in, in Athens. And uh, I, just, I know it grabs me. I don't know why. I start, as I start working on it, I'm trying to get to whatever the theme is. And when I finally figure that out, and characters sort of evolve by instinct to me, but once I, I know what the theme of the story is, then I do just what any 
fiction writer does. I, the, the protagonist embodies the theme, the antagonist embodies the counter theme. All the minor characters embody different aspects of the theme. So I will definitely um, take a lot of liberties with, with uh, not too much, but some. For instance, uh, in um, a book of mine about Alexander the Great, Virtues of War, there were, uh, you know, Alexander had like eight, nine, ten subsidiary generals who were great generals. And he couldn't, as you know, <laughs> Stephen, he couldn't have everybody in there. So I, I boiled it down to two, Hephaestion and Craterus. And, and, and I had to decide, because you, you didn't know too much from history about their personalities. So I basically thematically decided that Hephaestion was going to represent one aspect of, of, of war, and Craterus was going to represent another. And from that, I, they sort of started talking in their own voice. But I, I do it in a kind of a thematic sense, Pat. That's how I get it. That, how do you do it, Steve? Well, may I ask, does some of that come from training as a screenwriter? It's a very good because question. Because to me, that yes. sounds like screenwriting. Yes, it does come yeah. from that. Um, because hmm. as a novelist, I just do it by the seat of my pants. This but. protagonist, antagonist, <laughs> uh, but I know screenwriting is much more disciplined, and there are rules that people learn that work. You know the magic of storytelling. Yes. This has been worked out over time. But um, also, I found that from the seat of the pants gets you there uh -huh. to the to that. that it, you find I find that instinct. A character will sort of evolve and become well, a person, and then I'll say halfway through, oh, now I see why you know, that character seemed right. There are all kinds of ways of writing, and I remember once seeing Elmore Leonard speak, and um, he said when he starts writing a book, uh, he doesn't do this outline, he doesn't do this theme, blah, blah, blah. He says, I just start out with two guys talking in my head, and we just see where that takes us. And that is so different from anything I do. But obviously, there are these different channels that people can arrive at the story that's inside of them that they want to tell. But before I forget it, wait a minute. You mentioned We Were There. Yes. The We Were There series, which tied in with the Landmark Publishing was the name of the company. Oh. Um, that was so important to me as a kid, growing up in Gulfway, Texas, population 1200, middle of Texas. Uh, the We Were There books, when I in the 60s, uh, We Were There at the Battle of Britain, we were there with Stanley Livingston, all these books. And one of them was, there was a Cleopatra biography. I hate to come back to that. <laughs> but it was like, it was kind of big text, and it was a novel about Cleopatra, and it was illustrated all throughout with line drawings, you know, across the pages. And that book was just, I mean, that was also this huge touchstone for me. And then I, I there was a copy in our local library, a very small little library. And a number of years ago, after I started publishing books, I was back in my hometown of Gulfway. And I went by the library, and I, I located that book. And I mean, we're talking a library the size of a third of this stage. Mm -hmm. That's the size of the library in Gulfway. And I found the book, and I found the library, and a woman I know. And I walked over and I said, um, Mrs. Bruce, would you let me buy this book? This was before the days of eBay. You know, I didn't have any idea how to get my hands on this book. I said, you know, I noticed it hadn't been checked out, I think, since I checked it out. <laughs> <laughs> because they had the little card in the back with the day, you know. And I, so, you know, so I said, Mrs. Bruce, would you let me uh, make a contribution and, and could I have this book? And the look on her face, I realized I had really crossed a line. <laughs> it was all very well that I was little Stephen Saylor who'd grown up in Gothwaite, but uh, the archivist, you know, the spirit of the archivist, she said, well, you know, Stephen, one of these days, uh, some kid is going to need to write a report. <laughs> I need to have, but you know, I just did a fundraiser for them last fall because they need to build a new building. And as a gift, she gave me that copy uh. for speaking. She gave me a, that copy. And it had not been checked out once again since I checked it out. So, so there you have it. But wait, you know, I, there was something I wanted to say about this, um, this characters thing. Um, and that just is, in this last book I wrote, Roma, we do happen to have a copy I can show you here. It's a beautiful cover. Um, thousand years of Roman history told through these, these two families. I had to read all of Livius, uh, Titus Livy, straight through, which nobody would ever do in their right mind, uh, except it was a tremendous pleasure to read Livy's history of Rome, the early history of Rome. And in the foreword, and as I was reading about Livy and what historians say about him, it was pointed out that historians think of Livy now as being kind of the first historical novelist. Because unlike modern historians, Livy was allowed to put speeches into the voice, into the, the, the mouths of his characters. 
He was allowed to give them all kinds of psychological motivations, which he couldn't possibly have known. He was allowed to use legendary figures like Romulus and Remus and just put them right on stage. Uh, these are things a modern historian would never dream of doing because everything must be authenticated and true. Livy gives us essentially the great novel of the beginning of Rome. And as a commentator said, he doesn't do it by giving you the bricks and mortar and describing everything about the city of Rome. He does it by putting you on the scene with the people. If the city is being under siege by the Gauls, you feel what the Romans are feeling. If Hannibal is marching towards you, he puts you there inside their heads. So that became my rule for writing Roma. I, I did not want to expend a great deal on describing the city, although it very, is very important for you to know that the Romans invented the aqueduct and the roads and so forth, and all the temples that keep popping up all over the city. But I wanted to get into the heads of the people experiencing these events. So that, that becomes the challenge for the novelist in creating the character. I'd, I'd like to ask you about that, what, what that Kierkegaardian leap is to the point of audacity that you feel you can tell the stories of people who have been dead for 2,000 years or who never lived, whom you come up with, in order to convey these larger truths. Well, I think, again, it's the same as in any piece of fiction, Pat. You know, it, it, does, it does take a lot of either guts or stupidity. You, know, you just have to sort of uh, um, go for it. And one thing, you know, I remember the, the first time, the first book I wrote in Bagger Vance, I discovered that it is possible to write a character that's more intelligent than you are. Which I never, I never, <laughs> well, Stephen, you're very smart, so you don't have to worry about it. To but it really, it, it is possible to do that because of the flow that you can get into. And, um, but it does take some guts, like uh, Virtues of War is told in the, uh, in the voice of Alexander the Great. And you just have to be stupid and, and go for it, I think. There's no other, no other way. Yeah. You see, that's, that's something I've avoided doing because my trick, if you will, with the mystery series I write uh, is to see Rome through the eyes of my detective, my investigator. So he is always observing people like Caesar and Cleopatra and Mark Antony and Pompey. Uh, it's through his eyes that you see everything. So I, don't, I, I show you someone's view, essentially from underneath of those people, uh, to actually kind of get inside the head of Caesar. I, I have not done something like an I Caesar book. Uh, in, in Roma, uh, I do use, it's in third person, but almost always the central character of each of the episodes is not the protagonist. It's not Scipio Africanus taking on Hannibal, it's somebody who's a friend of Scipio's. It's not the Gracchus brothers who are trying to cause a social revolution in Rome, it's someone who's an ally of theirs observing their actions. Um, so that that's something that, that yeah. I've done differently as far as well, not I, daring to get inside the head of Alexander But I, I, I've done the same thing that you have, Stephen, mostly. I yeah. feel like a lot of times when you're writing about these larger-than-life characters, it's very daunting to try to get into their heads. So, and, it's, and it's also helpful to the reader to have an intermediate character, a, char a boy or something like that that's not threatening to the, to the reader but that can do it. I wanted to just say one other thing. What, what you guys as writers here will, will understand this. What, what allowed me to attack Alexander the Great was I just heard the first two sentences in my head, which was, I have always been a soldier. I have known no other life. And as soon as I had those two, that was, that was the, the voice and everything else went from there. And that just happened. Yeah. What are the... Um limitations, the awareness that you have yourselves of the, the pitfalls of anachronism. Obviously, you're not going to have people high-fiving in the forum, but you well, want something. <laughs> oh, yeah? No, no. <laughs> I, I didn't get to that piece. The origin of high-fiving. <laughs> but you, know, you want someone who's accessible, characters and, and conduct that's accessible, but at the same time, you don't want to make it comical in the sense of trying to make it so modern that it, has, it loses all sense of authenticity. How do you deal with that? Well, there. Are, I mean, you can go the Monty Python route, <laughs> uh, or uh, my fellow author Lindsay Davis, who also writes a crime series, Saturday Night in Rome. She shamelessly uses Cockney slang and, and so forth as anachronism. Um, I mean, one of the things is to adopt what we call the masterpiece theater uh, sound. You know, they all talk a little like Laurence Olivier. <laughs> you know, the the mid-Atlantic accent always helps. Um, 
you know, as far as psychological anachronism, it's like uh, some people have said, well, in, this, in the crime series you write, isn't Gordianus really a 20th century American in ancient Rome? his values, the way he looks at everything. And I don't really know that that's true because um, my, uh, there's a, a Tolstoyan view of history. Tolstoy believed that anywhere you went in the past or around the globe, you would find people who were essentially like you, who had some bedrock decency in common with you. And whether or not that view is true or not, it certainly is convenient for the novelist. Because we can, you know, I can find a protagonist in ancient Rome with whom I can really identify uh, and with whom the reader can identify. Because to write a, a novel in which the ground rules were so bizarre and so strange, uh, you would lose all sympathy and it would just be a, an academic exercise. A, a novel must be a psychological journey for the reader as well as the writer. Um, so that the Tolstoyan model is a convenient one, whether it's true or not. Yeah, in my experience, I think you, you are bound to a certain extent to the era that you live in because, just to make it accessible to readers, right? For instance, you know, Gates of Fire was about the Battle of Thermopylae, the 300 Spartans. And as I was researching it, it that story has been told and retold and retold. Operas have been, and I've read some of those. William that, Golding, The Hot Gates, one of my favorite books. Mm. And even, but even in like the 19th century, it's, you read the story and it's, in such a different vernacular that mm. it's totally remote. So for me, I just sort of had to bring it a little bit into the, into the present. And I've been accused that my characters talk more like contemporary Marines than, uh, than ancient Spartans. But again, like you say, Stephen, it has mm. to be accessible in this era. You know, 100 years from now, it might not be. But it, I think so you do have to bend history a bit, I think, and bring it into so. So, present where's day. your responsibility? Is it to history? Is it to the contemporary reader? How do you compromise those? Or it's a little bit of both, I think. That uh, you know, if you think about um, Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, he was not trying to do a, a an authentic biography of Caesar as it would have happened in Rome. He was writing in in his his time, and again, I think that he worked that piece of material just like a, a fiction writer or a playwright would. Thematically, it was about something. He had the characters. He used history, Plutarch's Life of Caesar. Am I right, Stephen? That's where the basically it came from. Shakespeare, yeah. uh, but he attacked it just like a playwright would, and um, and took lots of liberties with it. I have to say this since you mentioned Shakespeare, in doing the research for Roma, because it's that very particular period of Roman history. I mean, Shakespeare gives us three plays, the three Roman plays: Coriolanus, uh, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra. And I had occasion to watch many, uh, every DVD available <laughs> of those three plays and to read the text uh, because I wanted to know, you know, what various, because the most ancient part of Rome, we don't have a lot of popular fiction from uh, the really ancient Roman stuff, the Gracchus brothers and so forth, uh, a little about the Hannibal War, but we have Caesar for those three plays. And I have to say, as perhaps the creator of historical fiction for us, if plays are fiction, then Shakespeare is the great master. Because those three plays are impeccably researched. He did not have access to all the historians we do because they had not been translated and he did not, he had little Latin and less Greek as Ben Jonathan said. So he relied mainly on Plutarch. But his use of Plutarch and the other sources he had is absolutely impeccable. He never deviates from the historical record and he wrenches every possible amount of drama out of those three stories. So, I mean, that, and that's why Shakespeare is still here. <laughs> I know that one of the interests of the audience, and certainly an interest of mine as a nonfiction writer, is the research that you do. And any good writer has a ratio of at least five to one, what appears on the page to what the research is. 10 to one, 20 to one, probably in your cases. If you footnoted your work is if it were nonfiction, there'd be more footnotes than book. How do you approach the research, and more importantly, at what point do you set it aside? Because there is, in my business, such a thing as too much reporting. There must be such a thing as too much research that you feel you're drowning in facts, and it gets in the way of the story. What are your techniques? <laughs> you got to go first. Okay. That's a hard one. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm def I agree with you, Pat, completely. In fact, I would say to anybody who is thinking of writing or is writing historical fiction, don't let the research stop you from writing. And that's a real danger. Mm. You can use it as a form of, of resistance and a form of self-sabotage. And uh, there's a... Or uh, uh, putting off the inevitable. Yes, putting off <laughs> the inevitable, procrastination. I mean, one of the things that I sometimes do is I'll start the day, if I have a four-hour working day, and I'll, I'll just say, I'm going to do the first hour on research. And I'll actually sit at my laptop and I'll maybe transcribe something that I've, you know, tape recorded or something before, but when an hour's up, then I actually get in and, and start to write. But I also think one of the, um, one of the uh, maybe dirty little secrets of research is, I think it's vastly overrated. A lot of stuff I make up, at least in, <laughs> in historical fiction. And I also find that the stuff you make up is the most convincing. <laughs> Those are the things, am I right, yeah, Stephen? Well, Those are the little things I where people say to you, too. Wow, that was really real, you know. And then if, when you get to some, <laughs> but don't you have to? I mean, how? Where's the responsibility again? Don't when you write a scene Ooh. about, like in the Afghan campaign, the soldier getting on his horse. Don't you have to spend two hours to find out when the stirrup was invented? Yes, there is a I lot of truth. That's, okay. that's you know, you do have to obviously kind of master the material before you start. But for instance, the the ancient Spartans in, in Gates of Fire, uh, never they never wrote anything down. We have nothing written by a Spartan other than mm. a couple of fragments of poetry, and they were super secretive about their training, this and that, and the other thing. So basically, it was kind of a blank slate for, for me doing that. I, mean, I knew the, the, uh, the outlines of, of the historical event, but I was free to really make stuff up. And believe me, I mean, the city of Sparta was completely convinced by it. So <laughs> you, there's a, there's a, and I think you can do that because people don't change, you know? Warriors don't change, you know, not, nothing, uh, it, it's, all, uh, it's all what it used to be. Yeah, hmm. how do you say Semper Fi in Greek, I wonder? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> do I know how you say it in Latin. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, research, research, research. Yeah, you know, when I wrote my first novel, Roman Blood, I, d I kind of by the seat of my pants because I had studied Roman history years before, and I'd finally visited Rome, which was what ignited the great excitement for me to write this novel, uh, based on Cicero's first murder trial, uh, I did make a few little mistakes in that book. <laughs> uh, fortunately, my, my editor had a very hostile uh, reader for it. It was a historian whom I had kind of uh, mentioned in my afterward, and because he knew that historian, he uh, asked him to read my book in galleys. And the historian just was scathing, scathing. And my editor explained, well, it's because I won't take his novel. But I thought how fortunate I am to have had a really critical first reader because we went through it. I, it was mainly just words. Here, you know, I had marble a little too early in Rome on private homes and things like that. Um, in a later book, I did mention stirrups, by the way. <laughs> it's not there anymore. The, the great thing about having second editions and further printings is all you got to do is take out the word. <laughs> He didn't stay. There's no stirrups in my books anymore. Um, but you mentioned the things we make up. And it's like, I, the things that I actually will, am willing to make up, are they almost come out of the research in a way. Because when you immerse yourself in reading that, those Loeb classics, and just the translations especially that were made in the 1800s, and the footnotes, when you start just getting into the world of those footnotes, uh, the, the scholarship, your mind just enters, it's almost like a trance, just, just the way that, that all of this material works. So in one of my books, uh, The Venus Throw, I think I mention a couple of things. One was that uh, Zeus and Jupiter, <laughs> being the same god, that, that those names had come from onomatopoeia, that the way the Greeks had heard a, a lightning was Zeus. The way the Latins are heard it was Jupiter, <laughs> striking thunderbolt. And I happen to mention that, that, that those names originated with onomatopoeia. And then I also mentioned uh, something, oh yeah, when the Romans played dice game, uh, they actually did have sort of cubicle, um, cubicle dice, but they also used the bones from sheep. And when they would throw them, rather than us trying to get certain uh, straights and so forth, they would try to get them all different. So the highest score, and they had names for these throws, the Hercules throw, et cetera, 
the highest score was the one where all the dice were different. And that was called the Venus throw. And I said, that was because Venus craves variety. Uh, so I just mentioned these two things as if they came right out of the, the textbook. I just made them up off the top of my head. And I got a review in the Sunday Times from Ruth Rendell, who's just an absolute idol of mine. And she mentioned both of these things about Sailor's amazing scholarship. <laughs> he, the thing about Zeus and Jupiter being onomatopoeia and the Venus throw because Venus craves um, variety. And I just thought, I'm never going to tell her mm. that I just made that up. Well, now the question is, let me say something about this. Yeah, right, I think this is one of the, the, um, the virtues of historical fiction and why it's, it's, uh, it can get into deeper into mm. the stuff than, than pure history can. That was a great example about the Venus throw. I'll give you another example from, from, um, from Gates of Fire. Uh, nobody knows what, how, what, a, what a real shield was like in terms of how they used it in those days. But in there, in, in, in Gates of Fire, I put a, a little bit about how inside the bowl of each hoplite shield, he had lucky charms. Mm. You know, little things from, that his daughter would give him this, that, and the other thing. And that's not in any history book anywhere, mm. but you know mm -hmm. that that's exactly what it was like. And so that is because people always do that. Yeah. So um, that, I think, is where historical like a fighter fiction pilot. can really bring a fighter yeah, pilot, right. can bring right. something to it. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing I wanted to say, for just for, the, for our writers out there, that um, I also do kind of parallel research where it's not really studying what, what I'm actually studying, but other things. For instance, one of my books was about the ancient Amazons, the female warriors in the, from the steppes of southern Russia. And uh, so I just determined, fictionally, that they were going to be a horse culture and that that was why women could prove to be the equal to men on, mm. in, in warfare. So instead, there's nothing about that about the Amazons other than the graves of them that they are buried with horses. But from that, I just studied other horse cultures. I studied the Plains Indians of the American West, and I just ripped off, shamelessly mm. ripped off, any of the, of the uh, aspects of that culture that it's like, for instance, uh, bad manners to walk between somebody and the fire when you're sitting around, and things like that. And I think that's perfectly legitimate research, even though you can never prove it historically. Mm -hmm. Although there are, there are historians who would do exactly that kind of thing, the cross-cultural transpositions which they make. Um, but, so that's not out of the mainstream, I think. Oh. But yeah. th there, are, there, <laughs> there are people who spend their lives' work researching a 50-year period of pottery in a certain <laughs> part of the world. Do you get hate mail from people like that <laughs> who know better? Mm. You do get a little mm. bit of that, you know? There's, I use the word, I, I, I had a tomato in Gates of oh. Fire. Oh, yeah. You, know, okay. you get these things. They, they love to. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I had a hummingbird in one of my books, yeah. and hummingbirds are new world. So, that, so that, no hummingbird's tongues on Nero's Not menu? in the ancient. Well, there was a hummingbird flew into Guardianus' garden, and uh, just because a hummingbird had, fought, had probably flown into my garden, um, but, you know, but so we have to learn all these things. But fortunately, a reader will send me an email, and in the next printing, the hummingbird turns into a swallow. <laughs> That's uh, true. You know. <laughs> uh, so so the, the text is constantly evolving with my books. I'm, I'm really fortunate that they've stayed in print uh, all the, the, since they've been published. And we're doing, right now, my, my publisher is about to bring everything back out in a new trade paperback format. Uh, so the whole series will be brought back out again. And I am, for the first time in the 17 years since I published Roman Blood, I reread the book. I had not reread it since. Because uh, this is my chance to read the series straight through and to fix any continuity errors, also any of those hummingbirds and stirrups <laughs> that may still be in there. Did you learn languages to do this? Or did you get a bit of, you know, sort of... Uh I never did. I I complete. I even make up language, <laughs> like in. Uh, you both thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this, but in in uh, in Gates of Fire, I would. To, I, mm. I knew that I wanted to salt mm. in a few really authentic-sounding Greek words here and there. So I have a friend who is a, a Greek, and as I would, I was I was writing. I knew that there would be a certain place. Oh, this would be a great place for you know a Greek word. So I would send. I paid him five bucks a word. And I would send him, I sent him a list of like 45 things, you know, 45 uh, phrases that uh, I needed 
For instance, one was in making up the, uh, and again, this is, again, just fictionalizing, the, uh, the Spartan agogi, the upbringing that, that trained the young boys, uh, I, I, I knew that, that, that the Spartans must have had some samurai-like code, even though they obviously, it was all has been obliterated by history. So in my evolution of the story, I called it the science of fear. And I didn't know what to, what to, uh, you know, what to name that, so I gave it to my friend, Dr. Hippocrates Conzios, and he came back with Phobologia, and so that went yeah. into the book. And since then, I've gotten a bunch of emails from really, you know, from people yeah. that are like special forces, you know, and uh, where can I learn more about Phobologia? <laughs> <laughs> I feel sort of embarrassed ah. to tell them. Uh, well, uh, languages for me, I, yeah, I, a moment ago I quoted uh, Ben Johnson talking about Shakespeare. He knew little Latin and less Greek. Well, I am like Shakespeare in that way. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, good questions, Pat, by the way. <laughs> Very good. The, the idea of primary sources, I wonder if there's some appeal to writing about the ancient world because there are, compared to nowadays or even 200 years ago, fewer primary sources, and it gives you latitude. Mm. It really liberates you in mm. a way. Mm. Mm. Let me ask well, you you're a doing question, World Steven. War II now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> wait, I'd be so, so, but, so you, I have wait, a oh, okay. Do you believe in previous lives? Do you believe that you ever lived in ancient Rome? Um, no. I no. Don't. I don't believe it. No, I well, mean, trust I, me, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I'm going to ask you about World War II in a second because you, you asked about these primary sources. I did have occasion to write a, a book totally away from Rome uh, called A Twist at the End, which is about what I think is America's first serial murders, which took place in um, 1889 in Austin, Texas. I'm from Austin, so this became something I was fascinated by. And in researching that book about 1889 Austin, Texas, I was totally just inundated by the amount of material I could research at the Barker History Center and uh, in Austin, Texas, and in the, and the library there. Just the old newspapers. You can go into those 1889 newspapers and never come out. Because, I mean, it's all about phrenology, the science of head feeling. There's a phrenologist is coming through town, and he's got an ad, and then you get sidetracked into that. It's about patent medicines. It's about the, the politics. This is the seduction of research. This is seduction. So, yes, when, when I had the experience of doing something from a much later period where we have copious, copious material, that was a very different challenge from doing the ancient world where you, all you got is that the Loeb classics, really. <laughs> you got those two bookshelves of Loeb classics to, to work true. with. So I know you're working on a book or have written a book about World War II. Was the research totally different? Yes, and it's just exactly yeah, okay. what you said. And the reason <laughs> is, of course, that nobody can catch you in a lie mm. about something 2,500 years ago or maybe a little bit. But in World War II, there are a lot of people around who remember that you know, the, the, they didn't call you know a shaving yeah, kit okay. that by that name, or mm. that didn't happen. So it's been really hard. In yeah. fact, I've gone through many, many drafts. In fact, this the book w was was written uh, as if it were written by an English person. So I had to go through oh, this whole thing. That's of, a quadruple I did it all challenge. in the King's yeah. English, and that was really tough. Mm. So and there's still plenty of errors in there, I'm sure. A lot of fun, though. The, the oh, line yeah. from the Mikado adding verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. Do you mm. start with the plot? Do you start with the research? Mm. Um, I have a friend who, uh, Nancy, I just was telling you about my friend who's sort of a mentor to me, and he says uh, he has a great habit of boiling things down to their essentials, and he said that God invented a single yellow legal page paper to be exactly the right length to contain the entire outline of a novel. <laughs> so in other words, he was really telling us not to be precious and not to go into it. So I, I definitely feel like I start with the story. I want to know where it ends. I want to know sort of what it's about. And then the verisimilitude for me will come all by itself. It's probably the same for you, Stephen. I just, I love the details so much that I can't stop pouring them in there once, but the, it's the story that's the hard part. Well, actually, what I'm taking away from that is uh, uh, these last two books I've written, well, Roma, and then I'm writing a follow-up to Roma, which is Augustus to Constantine. Uh, one stage in the contract is I have to hand in an outline. 
Uh, and when I handed in the outline for Roma, well, I, I said, I would have an outline. I don't want to give it to them. Well, I'm going to say, when I, when I handed in the outline for Roma, it was 130 pages with the outline. <laughs> but I, I have an outline due for Roma 2 in May, and I, I'm going to remember this about the legal pad. <laughs> So that when I send in the I legal pad to that. my author, the, lead, the one page, I'm going to say, send, ch send check now. <laughs> Here is your outline. Um, in, in a couple of minutes, we'll start taking your questions so the Getty people who will be going through, through the audience will be able to. Uh, I think we'll have you stand up, and uh, the Getty people will have the microphone, and you can ask your questions. Um, to um, the sense of the contemporary that we talked about versus the ancient. To what extent do you consciously try to make that connection? Because when you see the title, The Afghan Campaign, you could put the face of an American soldier from last week on the cover of a book with this title. And Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empire. And so to what extent are you aware of or even trying to make connections to our modern sensibilities, even political ones? With me, it's different with each book. That book particularly, I really very definitely wanted to make modern connections and make it very plain that that's what it was all about. That's why the title, that's why that picture on, on the cover. But in other books that I've done, and you probably will agree with this, Stephen, I think, I've, I've really tried to, tried to be really true to, to, the, to the ancient, the way it really was then. But this was an exception. In fact, the, the photograph on the cover reminded me of the LA Times photo of the Marlboro Man, the famous soldier after battle with the cigarette oh, right. and the bruises. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, well, if you had yeah. a cigarette in his paint. mouth, that, you'd get <laughs> an email about that. Somebody would call you on The same people who caught you on the tomato yeah. would probably speak <laughs> up about tobacco, that. You know. and, and how do you see, especially with politics, of course, now? The, uh, uh, well, you know, in, reading, in the research for Roma, reading all that Livy, what really amazed me was how, um, how Livy, in looking back at Roman history 300 years before his own time, just how absolutely his, his political theory uh, seemed totally modern. Because when he looked at the, the class conflict between the plebeians and the patricians, uh, what he would see would be the patricians, the elite upper class of Rome, very jealous of their privileges, Try, even though they have elections and so forth, trying to keep everything er, er, under control. You know, they've got all of the, the cards in, you know, in their deck. The elections are always stacked to kind of support them. And whenever the, the uh, plebeians would, 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 get, uh, would, would, would try to change the status quo, they would actually sometimes go on strike. They would do what were called secessions, where they would literally abandon the city of Rome. They would just all get up and leave. Uh, say, we're not, we're not taking it anymore. Uh, or they would uh, refuse to serve in the military for a period of time. And the patricians would play their card, which was a kind of religion card. They would say, look, the gods are up there. They're looking after Rome. The gods have put us in charge. This is all just very obvious, isn't Wait, it? Wait, I heard that in 2000. And, and uh, <laughs> for you, and for you to kind of oppose us in this way is not merely a bad judgment on your part. It is blasphemous. And if you keep this up, the gods are going to withdraw their favor from Rome, and we're going to be conquered and enslaved. So you have these two forces at work. And meanwhile, on the bad side for the plebeians, you have the rabble rousers. And they're often upper class, educated politicians who decide that their pathway is to lead the common people. And they're kind of demagogues and take advantage you know, of every opportunity that arises. So those kind of politics in Livy, and the way he talks about them, are coached in those very cynical terms. Um, and that was a revelation to kind of sort of see how all of this has been done before. But then part of the reality of writing about history, of course, is that it's, it's all true. I mean, the parallels are there. You don't have to bring them in yourself as a writer. They, they just come out. And in ancient Greece, the conflict was always between the many and the few. Same as yes. Plebeians and Patricians, same as today. Although, when you, there's this other level you reach when you're doing the research. And that is where modern historians will argue whether or not Livy was transposing the values of his own time backward in time, 300 years, to, a Ro to, to Rome. So how reliable, are we really talking about Livy's era or is there yet another removal from the reality of Rome in 500 BC? So that, I mean, but that's the research that drives you crazy. You, know, <laughs> you just have to move on. 
we, talk, <laughs> we, we talked about people who read historical fiction as a kind of continuing education. And there are some people who would never read an actual history of Rome, who would never read an really? actual history book about the Afghan campaign. Uh, what are your, some of your favorite reader comments, your emails or letters that your fans send to you? Hmm. Well, I get a lot of stuff from um, Marines and Special Forces hmm. guys over in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and those are the real touching and things that, you know, that I don't even really know what, what to say about it, but it's, 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 it makes me feel, it humbles me to, to, to think that, uh, and, it's, and it's, um, it's a great compliment to the work that stuff you're writing about. People will say to me, this is exactly what it's like today. This is exactly what we're up against. And so that, that makes me feel pretty good. Like Livy, you have captured the experience of being there. For those Hopefully. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, I get a lot of emails from students because both here and in Europe, my books are often kind of used as uh, supplemental reading. And it's very touching that any student who was forced to read one of my books <laughs> would actually write me a kind note and, uh, and say so. Although every right. now and then I get, um, I get emails from a student where they're obviously trying to get me to do their work for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, Mr. Saylor, uh, can you summarize the plot of your novel, <laughs> Murder on the Afghan Way, in three sentences, please? Or, uh, uh, you know, it just is so, anyway. But, uh, but then I'm also, I am kept in my place all uh, by the fact that um, I know that not every reader out there, if you, as you say, not every reader would read a book about Rome. Um, being in the mystery genre, um, once I went to a reader's group in the San Francisco area, and they usually read mystery books. And they had assigned, uh, or they would ch had chosen my book because someone in the group knew me or something, and they knew that, that I would come and talk to them if they wanted. Uh, so all these mystery fans read one of my novels, and uh, I came, and I, I talked to them about the book and the experience. And one of the things I talked about was how my first trip to Rome, making visceral contact with those ruins uh, in the Forum and elsewhere, had just electrified me. And I had gone home just raging with this thing. I had to get back to Rome. And how exciting that was to see those ruins. And uh, a woman in the group afterwards said, uh, well, you know, I, I read your book. Um, and I, I've been to Rome, and I saw those ruins, but all I saw was a bunch of old bricks. And I, all I could say to her was, you know, my, maybe my books are not for you. <laughs> because, you know, because anybody who could, for example, go to the Getty and just see a bunch of old statues, yeah. <laughs> I don't, what would that be? Is there, a present company excluded, is there one piece of historical fiction that someone else has written that you admire, some other genre, some other period, that you picked it up and you thought, wow, this is mm -hmm. yeah, really good? I'm really more of a guy to go to the ancient sources themselves. Mm -hmm. um, to me, um, Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, Plutarch, I know it sounds kind of nutty, but I just, I just love reading that stuff. I always have, from long before I even was a writer. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any really, I sort of avoid reading that stuff, Pat. I, I'm, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. have anybody else's voice get into my head. Um, but I always consider it a great compliment when somebody sends <coughs> an email and says they read something of mine and it took them and now they've read Thucydides. Hmm. And I say, ah, God bless, you know, okay. that's great. But yes, cross-contamination is one of those concerns. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. yeah. Um, for me, in the period between seeing Cleopatra <laughs> at the Dryden Theater, and going to the University of Texas and really studying history, I read all of Mary Renault, uh, The Persian Boy, Fire from Heaven, The King Must Die, and those novels were really important to me. I mean, me living I'll in Gulf Texas, there. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I should say Mary Renault. Mary yes. Renault was just a tremendous, a tremendous big deal in my life. Um, um, and I, I generally, I don't read a lot of, of current historical fiction, partly because just all the read. I do so much reading uh, all day long that at night I just want to watch Law and Order, <laughs> and American <laughs> Idol. You know, I, I don't really want to go there. But um, uh, I have lately in the research for Roma too. I've been uh, doing nothing but kind of Roman history all day long, and then at, at night my bedtime reading has been historical fiction about that particular period of Rome, and I have encountered some really interesting novels. Like right now, I'm reading, and I think this man has vanished from 
the syllabus, Frank G. Slaughter. Does, a show of hands, oh, yeah. does anyone here remember Frank G. Slaughter? Well, well, okay, because you know, when I was a kid, Edna Ferber and Taylor Caldwell and Frank G. Slaughter were these enormous, towering bestsellers. Well, he wrote a novel about Constantine the Great, and I just picked it up just to kind of see what it's like, and it's a terrific book. I mean, I could see why, this, why Frank G. Slaughter was a big deal, because it's a page turner. I can't put this thing down. Why do you think some historical fiction for some reviewers doesn't get the respect that you think it deserves? Mm. Is, it the, very good is it the quality of the it writing? It certainly or is doesn't it? get the respect. <laughs> you know, it's, That's it. <laughs> I think it may be the quality That's of the it. writing. Historical <laughs> fiction. I think people think you're cheating in a way because uh, you're using stories that are already there. You know, you're not really mm. making up something pure, mm. pure fiction. But also it's a little bit like science fiction too. I think that, that uh, Writers of historical, like science fiction people get carried away with some concept, you know, in the future, you know, our brains will be, you know, the world can revert, you know, and then that's all they do, right? They don't actually tell a story. Um, and I think that's the same thing kind of happens in historical fiction and bad historical so fiction. So science fiction gets carried away with the gadgets and historical yeah. fiction gets carried away with the history. Yeah, the past or the reality of the past and, and, and doesn't, the writers don't hold themselves to really trying to do a good book that's about something yeah. and not just a, a retelling of, a, of something that happened in So the if past. you obsess about Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, you're probably going down. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I saw Cleopatra again last year, <laughs> I was really struck by, you know, there was a time when this movie was people's idea of popular, popular entertainment. And all those, I've been re-watching all these ancient world movies on, on DVD made in the 50s and 60s and everything, and these were like really popular. And I watch them now and I think, God, there's a lot of history in these movies, a lot of politics. I mean, all of this Machiavellian stuff uh, in, in Cleopatra between Octavius and Mark Antony and stuff, I don't think any audience would sit still for this. <laughs> I don't think they would uh, Which is why HBO's Rome was so dumbed down. I mean, just incredibly dumbed down. Uh, and yet, they, they passed up just some of the best stuff, some of the best Machiavellian you know, interplay of politics. Or I, Claudius. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yes, yes. That yeah. would be great. So that, uh, yeah, I think there's, a, there's an impatience in the audience. But, but you ask about historical fiction and, and you know, whether it's respected and so forth. I just think that in my lifetime, the dominant, the paradigm has been a particular genre of fiction. And it's called psychological realism. And it's no different than any other genre of fiction. But we have been taught that this is real fiction. It's got to be about a college professor's adulterous affair and Providence last summer and how this almost drove his wife to suicide. <laughs> and that is a great novel. Whereas a novel about Alexander the Great is somehow trivial. Now, I don't understand that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. I know we're going to get questions that aren't trivial from you, so let's begin. If you want to raise your hands and we'll know where to find you. We're going to keep the microphone. No, please don't hand over the microphone. Thank you. I know you all have great things to say. Could you stand up so we can see you as well as hear you? And if you could proffer the microphone and just not keep it in your grasp. I'm sorry, we don't want to have runaways. <laughs> OK, can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm a grad student in history, uh, specifically Rome. And we've been arguing a lot about metaphors. You know, my teacher often says that it's like you know, this war it, that we're in right now, or this is like George Bush, da, 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 da. And we've been arguing, and I think that we have a lot of similarities with, let's say, women in the ancient world because we have children and, you know, we're homebodies or whatever we look at. But at the same time, I think we lose something when you compare it to a modern event because you, you, you don't, the context isn't there. I think we need to put it back into the historical context. Now, how do you find a balance in fiction where it's both in the historical context, but also we can identify? Ooh. That is a hard <laughs> one. You ask harder questions. <laughs> um, that's the real challenge, is to make, is to present an event or a personality and to give them their due as to what they really meant to their contemporaries and why people reacted the way they did, and yet to somehow make the current reader get emotional about it. I mean, I get emotional about Julius Caesar. I get mad and angry, and I, you know, and I change my mind three times a day, uh, the way other people do about Bill Clinton, or you know, 
Um, or Britney Spears. Or Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Britney Spears. So yeah, that is a great challenge because you do want to do that. You do want to make the reader feel just as emotional about Caesar's war atrocities in Gaul as the people in Gaul did. Uh, and yet, you know, how do you bring that forward and how do you not make it, try to make it too topical? Um, Mm. Uh, mm. <laughs> I think when it's when you're really immersed in in that world, whatever it is, and you, and you then you do establish the context, and it and and the parallels will kind of arise all by themselves. You don't mm. really need to kind of shoehorn them in there or lever them in there. Um, I think that they'll come right by themselves. Yeah, I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right. If you presented the story in a way that grips the reader in their own emotions, they'll, they'll come to their conclusion, yeah. Another question? A couple here. Can you stand up, please? Yes. Um, Mr. Saylor, you talked about a um, 130-page outline. <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering if you follow the outline. Uh, in this case, yes. Yeah. Because oh. I, I had never previously outlined a book. I had always oh. begun with kind of just what I call running notes. Uh, and I go through that book, and once I reach the last note, uh, the book's over. I keep at it. Uh, <laughs> but for this particular book, because I knew Roma was going to be a really long book, and because my agent knew that it would be a long time between checks, <laughs> what an agent thinks about, he put this clause in there that if I, in the middle of the process, I was to hand in a thorough outline. And once it was approved, I would get another check. That's really important. Uh, so I, that induced me to do something I'd never done before, which was to truly sit down and write just a summary, a long summary, and to kind of um, flesh out each scene. This is the scene. This is the scene. This is the scene. And that is the best thing I ever did as a writer, the best thing I ever did. Because when it came time to write the book itself, uh, I never had any stoppages at all. I always knew what the next scene was. And it was a matter of just filling in the dialogue, the food, uh, the scenery, and so forth. Um, so working from a very thorough outline like that was uh, a really good tool for me. Oh, right next to you on your left, please. I can't help but ask you uh, what you thought of the movie 300. And also, um, uh, you mentioned the dumbing down of the HBO uh, movie Rome. What's your reaction to the statistic that there's a continuing lack of knowledge of history by young people? I mean, how's that going to affect your readership? I mean, a movie as sophisticated as Spartacus is going to be put out on the big screen today. It's much more you know, graphic special effects. Let's start with Mr. Pressfield. Yeah, 300 question. <laughs> Well, my mother always told me never to say, if you can't say something good, <laughs> don't say anything. Um, and I, I certainly am, can't be objective about the movie mm -hmm. 300, but, but I will say this. I think that um, that kind of graphic novel, comic book treatment of something is valid for material that is pure fantasy, like mm -hmm. Superman or Spider-Man or for something that's a real intense genre thing like Sin City that also Frank Miller did. But I think that when you use that technique to, to, um, to evoke a, a, an historical event, and particular one, particularly one like Thermopylae that was, uh, that was very real, and, and real men really fought and really died, and real women suffered, and, and the whole um, uh, you know, course of civilization was changed, I think it, it's, it's a disgrace, really. It's a, I think that uh, if, if we could beam ourselves into heaven and show that movie to the 300 Spartans themselves and ask them what they thought about it, I don't, I don't know what they'd say, but I don't think it would be too positive. So, but that said, it was a hit. It hit the bullseye. And, uh, but, so but, but let me ask you about the moral obligation, since so many people, as you point out, don't know anything about the actual history and think the movie is the history. For example, in the movie Titanic, they had the first officer mm. committing suicide when, in fact, he survived and his family threatened to sue over the movie. Uh -huh. Why take liberties when the history itself is so compelling that to vary from it, especially when you have an audience who doesn't know any better, 
Why would you conceivably do that, except for the sake of making a better story, in which case it's no longer history? Well, in this, in this case, Pat, I think it was just somebody that really had their, they had their real finger on the video game world, mm. on what the young audience is looking for, and, uh, you know, uh, that, that was it. It was, it was designed to be hit, and it was a hit. Yeah, I mean, 300 goes so egregiously beyond anything resembling historical fiction. I mean, we can't even categorize it <laughs> as historical fiction. It's like a fantasy created by. But you know, there, there are just all kinds of ideas about this because uh, Thornton Wilder wrote a very successful book called uh, The Eyes of March about the assassination of Caesar. And he wanted to have certain people who were dead at the time that Caesar was assassinated, like Clodius, on stage. So he just had Clodius still alive years after he was dead. And in his afterward or forward, he said, uh, this novel is a fantasia on Roman themes. So uh, to do what he wanted, he had a classification for this. So the 300 is definitely a fantasia yeah. on historical themes. To put it uh, but then we do feel, you know, you, do wonder, you wonder what, uh, what readers know and how much history is actually being taught. Uh, those are real questions. Um, I myself, I just, you know, I almost never encounter a case where what the historians have given us isn't just so good that I can't really improve on it. And yeah. part of that reason is historians like Livy and Suetonius and Plutarch were the first historical novelists. And they just, they, they wanted their readers to keep turning those pages. The and they gave to, us great stories. The question too is, was to the teaching of history. And when you don't teach it, it creates a vacuum where some guy who makes a video game that is purportedly the history of the Spartans at Thermopylae can fill a gap that the schools don't. Uh, yeah, don't of course fill. we're filling that gap too, and that that's that's our stock and trade. Is people are are hungry, I think, to know about you know, the Civil War, about you know Marie Antoinette, and hopefully you know this is what we're hopefully making things accessible. But I mean, what is reality? Uh, does anybody know who killed Kennedy? Uh, were there WMD? I mean, there are all kinds of fictions out there in the world, and what people believe. I can't be responsible for it because you know because there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of really weird beliefs out there that seem to be you know ruling the world. Um, Is there another question right there? Hi, I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of both of your works. Um, one of the central problems I was a history major and a political. Science I don't think major. we can hear you. Is the mic on? No. I'm a big fan. Of <laughs> I hear you. I hear that. Yeah. I was a student of history at UCLA as well as political science. And I was a very argumentative child. I was always questioning the source that they would cite for their history. Mm. And I, every time they give me a quote, I'd give them, uh, well, all history is bunk, or <laughs> you know, Rashomon, people lie all the time. Five people can see the same event, and each one depending on their own bias even when they're not aware of their bias, are still capable of telling you very different stories. So ultimately, if the purpose of telling your stories, like Shakespeare, was to entertain, to get people outside of themselves for a little bit, maybe they think about something more than themselves, but I would think that would be very liberating for a historian, because short of having a time machine, no one knows for a certainty anything. Scientists keep changing what we know when they think of this is hard okay. science. And, you know, oh, white matter doesn't matter in the brain. Oh, oops. It's, there's 10 times more of it than gray matter. So we were wrong. OK. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So now we get into, you know, meta history. I mean, are, are the historians to be trusted at all? Because they always have their own. Um, their own axes to grind, their own agendas, whether, they're in, whether they are pro-imperial, anti-imperial in ancient Rome. Um, so yeah, when you're, when you're essentially a novelist, I think you are there. You're doing many, many things at once. And I mean, I have, in writing novels which are crime fiction and historical fiction and psychological stories as well, you know, you just keep all these balls in the air. Um, and the novel is a creation that we came up with that serves a certain function. Uh, it takes us 
out of ourselves, it takes us into ourselves. So that the fact that Stephen and I happen to write historical fiction is a smaller matter to the fact that we write novels, I think. I would, I would agree completely. I, I'm really not, I don't consider myself a historian, and I'm not really in the business of retailing history. Uh, something grabs me about an event, I don't know what it is, and I, I just want to sort of bring it to life, and I want to kind of follow it through to what it's about, mm. and uh, that's kind of my motivation. I'm really not trying to tell history or, or anything like that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, Rashomon, it's how many different angles are you going to look? It's always different. You know, it, it's something about story. Uh, human beings spend so much of their time outside of where they are in the moment. I mean, we spend so much of our time in memory or having an erotic fantasy or watching Law and Order or thinking <laughs> about the trip we're going to take next week. Or Cleopatra. I mean, so much of our psychic existence is outside of ourselves. And these novels allow us what I call more life. I will never know Julius Caesar, uh, nor will I ever be on the moon, uh, nor will I ever do a million things. And yet, the function of fiction allows us to have more life, to be larger than we are. And so historical fiction specifically allows us I was thinking, you know, I, I was in the Getty yesterday, walking through the collection, and I, you know, I was just awestruck, I was astounded, and I thought, this is an historical fiction. I'm standing inside <laughs> an historical fiction. Because J. Paul Getty had this vision of putting these artifacts in a context which would do something beyond just what a curator does when he looks at an object. Um, so the Getty itself is a kind of historical fiction. We're in a villa, but it's not really a villa. <laughs> we're in Herculaneum, but we're really in California. Um, um, so it, it's, it's just more life. Another question? This way? Can you stand up, please? Oh, okay. Sorry, there were so many people raising hands. Um, I'm wondering if you find it an issue that you fall so in love with the characters about whom you're writing, these famous people, that you end up justifying their actions. And I'm thinking of this because, for instance, Colleen McCullough, who's written the excellent series on Rome, obviously thinks Caesar you know, does everything short of walking on water. Whereas uh, I had the pleasure of working with Jonathan Stamp, who was the historical advisor on HBO's Rome. And I once casually sent him an email saying, you know, Caesar, good guy or bad guy, and I think his words were something like, he was a genocidal maniac, you know, for starters. So do you find that it's a problem to over-identify with these characters and justify um, what they've done and who they were? I think that that is a danger, and it sort of does happen a little bit. I think you just can't help but do it. If you're writing a, the autobiography of Charles Manson, you're going to somehow come around a little bit to say, well, you know, maybe he had a point, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> write that he novel. He was a hell of a right guitar there. player. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, mm. it's, yeah, that, it, it is a danger. It's hard not, not to do that. I, I'm guilty of it a little bit myself, I confess. I think I, I, there is a glamour about these people. Obviously, there's a glamour about Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a seduction about these people. They're the jet setters of their time. Just as we find ourselves seduced by Brad Pitt and Angelina, uh, we find ourselves fascinated by these people. Of course, Brad Pitt never waged genocidal war on anybody, to my knowledge. Um, I think uh, there was a quote I came across by L. Sprague de Camp, who was a big uh, science fiction writer, also wrote some history books. And he says something about, it goes something like this, uh, the great figures of history are rather like the larger beasts. They are best viewed behind sturdy bars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that really struck a note with me because I was really deep into Caesar at that point. Uh, you know, this is a dangerous man. You do not want to cross this man. I mean, it, it, the, essentially, those old Romans were, uh, HBO got it right for sure that they were gangsters. I mean, you know, that these were gangsters, ruthless gangsters, willing to do anything. Um, so they're very frightening. Uh, they're, they're one step away from, from, um, from sociopathic. 
So it does frustrate me sometimes when I see the great figures of history kind of just given a blank check. You know, oh, they wiped out a village of 80, or a, you know, a city of 80,000 people. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't think we would forgive people now. And it worries me that in 2,000 years, uh, the glamour could attach to Adolf Hitler, say. You know, I mean, you and I know different because we're too close to that. It's too painful. And I'll tell you, those Gauls, they knew different, too, uh, after what Caesar had done. Um, here, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Up here? That's good. I just want to know if, uh, if Gates of Fire is ever going to be a movie or has 300 sort of preempted that? I, I, it's a very good question, but I, I am afraid that 300 probably set Gates of Fire back many years. <laughs> Anybody on this side? Down here in the middle again. Can you stand up, please? Thank you. Actually, if you can be stentorian, perhaps we can hear you. I can hear uh, influence your writing? Well, you know, I was, I was only a reservist, uh, not a combat marine. Um, but, you know, the, the immersion in the, in the training and in, you know, that whole uh, group of male thing, definitely, you, you know, you soak that up and it becomes part of it. But a lot of it is, is imagination and, uh, and, and fiction. We have time for Good a couple, question. couple more questions. Where? Yeah, I don't time. see. Raise your hand, please. There, down in front. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I'd like to ask you, uh, first of all, I, I think you might remember Harold Lamb. Oh, Harold Lamb. Who yeah. wrote a lot of those kind of books. But I wonder if you saw any earlier versions of the ancient history, like um, uh, Knights of Cabiria from 1913, or, or some of the earlier um, De the DeMille, Cleopatra, or even mm -hmm. Quo Vadis, which was kind of cleaned up Rome. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know. MGM Rome, we I'm, I'm kind of, a, I would have gone on a quest in recent years of just tracking down every movie ever made about the ancient world. It's just become a hobby that's bordering on mania now. And because of, of the DVD, thank goodness, these things are just coming out all over the place. And, and things that we've never heard of before or seen before are now available. You can also buy DVDs from Amazon DE in Germany. Some of them are in English. So I'm just, I'm constantly looking at all movies that have been made about the ancient world. Go to my website, please. I have pages about this. Um, mm. And uh, you mentioned specifically Quo Vadis. For example, there have been at least three versions made. The very worst one is the 1952 version, I think, with um, Peter Ustinov doing the worst Nero imaginable. I, that may just be complete heresy to say. But he's very this funny. He, well, Nero wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then there was a, an Italian TV series done with Klaus Maria Brandauer, which isn't very good. But then there was a Polish movie made about five years ago. The most but it was written by a Pole. So. Yes, uh, 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 Sienkiewicz won a Nobel Prize for, for writing Quo Vadis. And they made a Polish movie about five years ago, which is available on DVD with English subtitles. You can get it. And it is exquisite. It's uh, maybe six hours long or something. And the man who plays Nero, it was, a, it was a miniseries. The man who plays Nero is absolutely terrifying. You just every time he's on the screen, you, you just go, you break out in a cold sweat. And, and I think some of this is because I mean, he's, he's portrayed sort of like Stalin, really. He's a man of such immense power that Petronius, you know, who's the, the, not the central figure, but one of the main characters, who's the great artist, is treading this razor's edge between entertaining Nero and being beheaded by Nero at any moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm into those movies. I'm really into those movies. One more question. Um,
Um, yes, hello. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that in, in this discourse about uh, different uh, historical interpretations uh, present in the Western civilization, finally somebody not from the English uh, language was mentioned, Sienkiewicz, <laughs> yes, uh, the yes, great Sienkiewicz. writer, Axel Munte, uh, etc. Um, my question to you, it seems to me that the research is to a good extent done by the historians. Fact finding, it is something that eventually can be maybe farmed out. Um, the context, the atmosphere, you, when you start writing, you have in mind a destination, you climb into your time machine, do you have a test to determine where you stopped? whether you stopped where you wanted to? I mean, is that the place? Is that the surrounding? Is, does it make sense? Because you don't have the luxury of Mr. Getty. When, when means are infinite, yes, he experimented and it was a very good, very successful experiment. You are more mm. limited in means. I, I would be very curious. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you're limited at all. I think you Ooh. have a lot more uh, s scope than Mr. Getty because we can go anywhere our imagination takes us and, uh, and penetrate as deeply as, as our, our imagination can, can penetrate into anything. Hmm. And I, think, I think some of your question is about how do you know when you get it right? Yeah, when because you make the metaphor of the time machine. You know, you set the dial for 51 BC, uh, but when you get out, does it really smell like 51 BC? Uh, you know, and once again, that is just, that is the novelist. You know, that's really not the historian, that's the novelist. I go back to, to Livy, uh, to enter into the minds of these people and to be there in the moment. Um, I think, you, you know, you could read a contemporary novel where all the notes are false where that story of the adulterous professor doesn't ring true. And that's not because such things don't exist or because they didn't know everything there was to know about Harvard or something. Or adultery. Or adultery, right? <laughs> but they just didn't manage to hit the right notes, you know? So the same thing with historical fiction, to try to get the voice of certain people uh, inside their heads. Is, is there a difference between fact and truth? Is that what you're about? Hmm. Fact and truth. Yes. I think there is, and I, I think a novelist is trying to get to truth, and that's why it's called fiction. Yeah, but isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's those facts that really draw you in, because you mentioned coming across facts. these stories, and those stories are what sets you on this whole path. There's just some sentence that's true, in yeah. a book, you know, and you've got to know more. You've got to know the what rest else? of the story. What else? Don't forget the reception afterwards, at which these gentlemen will be kind enough to give you some of their time. So will you please thank them for being out here this evening. Thank you for coming.